Hello, my name is Yuri Bogomolov and I work as a Wits Software Engineer at IPAM Systems. For the past four years I've been teaching function programming using statically typed languages like TypeScript, Scala or Haskell. And today I will be talking about making illegal states unrepresentable, specifically with examples using TypeScript. So before we begin d uh, diving deeply into technical stuff, uh, let's think a bit about what is legal state. Uh, you may find mm, several examples in your domain, but I'll give you a few which I have personally encountered. So for example, passing user's name to a function which expects user's email, because those two entries are strings, and strings are indistinguishable one from another uh, to the TypeScript compiler. Another example could be calling a function which expects validated data with something raw, uh, for example, data which came over the wire or was read from a file. Another example would be around constructing objects which are incorrect from business perspective. Uh, for example, they are partially built or uh, they don't hold some properties. Another example would be executing uh, an incorrect chain of functions. Uh, for example, uh, in financial domain, uh, causing a double write-off. Um, and in general, making illegal state transitions of a finite state machine. For uh, those developers who are familiar with React and Redux, you may imagine dispatching an action uh, from uh, the application state, uh, which shouldn't allow doing this uh, uh, dispatch. So, to state uh, what is making illegal states on representable approach, I should say that it um, it's all about statically proving that all runtime values correspond to valid objects in the business domain. And I've highlighted three keywords here. The first one is statically, which means we will use the compiler to enforce this uh, strictness. The second one is runtime, which means we don't want to just play with types, we need to prove things about our runtime values. And the third one is valid, which means we need to ensure that all business logic and business pro and properties uh, hold. So you've guessed it. The answer is types to the rescue. And the first topic I'd like to be um, talking about is called smart validators and opaque types. So an opaque type is a type which uh, wraps another type, probably primitive type like string or number or boolean, um, and uh, has no runtime representation, uh, which is different from the wrapped type. So. Uh, in the example here, I'm uh, creating a type called user ID, uh, which is a wrapper around string, um, but it will be different uh, to the TypeScript compiler uh, from just plain string. Um, due to lack of nominal typing in TypeScript, um, in order to implement opaque types, we need to um, make some tricks, but they are not very hard. Um, and I should note that in FP first languages like Scala 3 or Haskell, opaque types are part of the syntax and uh, developers um, have no need to invent or reinvent the wheel. Um, so this is um, one of the example of how could a pack type uh, wrapper be implemented. So as you can see, a pack type accepts two arguments, which uh, are the first is type uh, target type T, uh, uh, base type T. Uh, and the second is unique symbol, uh, which will serve as a compiled time tag, which will differentiate the base type uh, from another opaque 
wrapper around the same base type. Um, and here's the same example you've seen on the previous slide, how we use opaque types. Uh, so here I've created a type called user ID and a variable of that type. The th second part of this equation is called smart constructor. Uh, it's just a function uh, which will return either error or several errors um, or the input type as uh, cast to uh, the validated type. Um, developer shouldn't be able to construct an instance of this uh, so-called smart type without using a constructor. And of course, type cuts using any or unknown uh, should not be allowed. And here's uh, an example uh, from uh, production project. Um, creating a validator for users email um, using an incredible library called IOTS um, and its satellite library called IOTS types. So email validator is a branded type for string, uh, in other words opaque type for string, which uses uh, regex to validate uh, the input and if validation fails uh, it will give a nicely formatted error uh, and in the example below you can see that uh, i cannot create a variable of type email and assign it any string but i can use a uh, function decode from email validator to um, get a validation of email and validation is just an eyes um either container um, which has an array of uh, validation errors at the left side and in this case email on the right side. So as a rule of thumb uh, all data coming into programs boundary should be validated using types with smart constructors uh, because they actually do runtime validation. Um, and uh, you want to validate uh, data which comes over the wire or from the um, database, especially from, uh, data uh, from databases with, um, with a non-strict schema like DynamoDB or MongoDB. Each public key of all domain entities should be modeled as a separate opaque type. Uh, so, uh, Using this approach, uh, you will eliminate um, a whole uh, kind of errors where you um, refactor your system and uh, introduce some parameter or remove some parameter. And uh, for example, uh, for code which uh, passed user ID in place of order ID, you will get a compilation error. And finally, inside the program's boundary, uh, you should use uh, simple opaque types uh, to avoid performance hit uh, caused by uh, unwrapping an ISO in IOTS. Um, the next topic I'd like to uh, present is called type level programming. Um, and in this section, we'll take a look uh, at how we can make the TypeScript compiler our best friend and make it ensure that different properties hold and that uh, actually you can do um, quite a lot of things with types. When I teach type level programming to others, I always say that uh, you should accept this mental model that types should be treated as values and generics uh, should be treated like type level functions or combinators. For example, let's take a look at um, the generic type replace dip, uh, which could be um, looked uh, at like a function, except in three arguments. The first one is target type. The second is path in that type, probably with uh, nested um, 
types. And the third one is um, replacement type, which should replace uh, the type of field located at the path uh, inside the type. Um, and here's an example of its usage. We have an interface of a user uh, which is stored in some kind of database and it, it has uh, an attribute called is active of type boolean. And for our business logic, we need to work with only active users. So we use replace deep uh, function to replace uh, the type of is active field with just boolean literal true. Uh, using this type, I cannot construct an incorrect object uh, which will have uh, which will be of type active user and have is active field equal to false another example let's suppose uh, you're working in the e-commerce domain uh, and your domain entity is obviously order which has ID issue date comment and some kind of state and you need to implement update order function for your API. How would you do it? So the first approach would be to create a function called update order, except in two arguments. And the fir first one would be order ID, and the second one would be update to perform for that order. And we model it like a partial type using partial uh, type combinator from uh, TypeScript standard library. And suppose uh, you have an order ID to test this function. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work because um, you can call uh, update order function uh, with um, an empty object. And in general, you don't want to do this because um, this will result either in a broken query or some kind of database exception. Uh, but you can call update order with an object which uh, has only a set, subset of fields from uh, the full order, which is totally okay. But again, this doesn't work for all examples. Okay, the second approach, uh, fine. We'll get rid of partial and make update order re uh, require full order as an update. Um, this approach will reject empty object uh, as an update payload, which is totally okay, but it won't accept partially built order. Uh, and for large domain entities, uh, having update order uh, or in general update functions uh, accept a fully built uh, entity uh, might be too much from the perspective of performance. So this approach doesn't work either. So how would we solve this using type level programming techniques? Uh, first, we create type combinator called at least one, which turns our target type T into a giant sum type uh, with only one field required or, and all other fields would be marked as um, partial, non-required. Finally, we model our update order function using uh, the at least one of order as update payload. And this implementation actually works perfectly well because it uh, will reject empty object as update payload in the compile type. So uh, you won't be uh, doing this checks in the runtime, having uh, code uh, which will perform better. Uh, but uh, this function will accept any combination of fields from the order. Again, uh, even the full fully built order will work well here. Uh, but I can pass uh, any combination of fields in the update payload. Another advice uh, I can uh, give in this section is to use never type to your advantage. Uh, never is an incredibly useful uh, type because uh, from the uh, type theoretic uh, perspective, it's the bottom type of TypeScript's 
uh, type system, which means never is uh, a subtype of any imaginable type. Uh, thus, uh, no type could be assigned to never, and we cannot have uh, a variable of type never in the runtime. And here um, I've created a, a type combinator which um, checks if its argument s um, is prefixed with slash. Um, this type combinator allows us um, to write a function called require slash, uh, which will compile with only those strings which start with a slash. For example, this function uh, could do something with um, express routes, for example, or in general, HTTP uh, routes. Um, do some checks or validation or whatever. And it won't compile uh, because the compiler will give us warning that uh, string hello with exclamation is not assignable to type never uh, because our type combinator prefixed with slash uh, will infer the result type as never because its argument is not uh, starting with slash. Especially useful um, example of uh, never type uh, could be uh, seen using algebraic data types and uh, discriminated unions uh, like the one uh, I'm showing here. So uh, in the switch um, statement here, uh, I'm uh, discriminating over tag of the variable x of type ADT, uh, and in each case, uh, the type of that variable is narrowed down, uh, down to, um, to the respective branch of ADT type. And uh, we could just live with that, but actually, I suggest to add a default case, which will call an absurd function with a variable x because in this default case, uh, due to the fact that we have covered uh, all possible cases of tag, uh, the variable x is inferred uh, to be of type never, and we can call function absurd. For those of you who haven't met absurd before, it's a function which accepts an argument of type never and returns uh, anything you want. It's polymorphic over type t, uh, so, uh, for those of you who are familiar with first-order logic, uh, absurd corresponds to the false predicate. So it says, prove me falseness and I will prove you anything. Uh, and uh, in TypeScript's uh, type system, there are mm, only several valid implementations of absurd possible. The first one would be to throw an exception, as I'm doing here. The second one would be calling process exit. And the third one would be just returning uh, its argument of type never. And due to the fact that uh, never is assignable to anything, we can uh, return x here and it will be inferred of type t. But I don't recommend using the uh, latter approach because mm, suppose that in the previous uh, switch uh, some of your colleague um, have suppressed a warning that uh, check for tag is non uh, exhaustive so for example you have added a new case uh, to the ADT type and haven't added a new case into the switch uh, and uh, written TypeScript ignore error uh, direct. Uh, if the absurd function uh, is implemented using the identity function approach, uh, or to, do, uh, to say it more simple, if it returns its argument x, uh, then uh, your program in the runtime um, time will um, result in possibly incorrect state, which uh, we in general try to avoid here. Uh, so I recommend to throw an exception and this exception should not in the production code be just of type error as I've written here. It should be uh, your uh, easily distinguishable uh, unique exception type. 
And uh, so the developer who suppresses uh, the compiler warning will have uh, the code blow up uh, during the runtime and actually go and fix things instead of uh, just letting it be. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in this topic, I recommend to refer to uh, my talk about uh, type level programming in TypeScript, which I gave at IT Subotnik in Moscow. Um, the repository with examples are, uh, is located on the GitHub and the recorder itself is available on the YouTube. The next topic I'd be talking about is uh, tagless final design pattern. In 1992, um, a paper called Finally Tagless Partial Evaluated was written by Oleg Kisilov and his comrades. And uh, this paper introduced um, a design pattern uh, for building embedded domain-specific languages uh, in a common language. So what's all this about? Um, Tagless Final implies coding to an interface of some kind of effect. So as developers, we abstract away the type of um, side effect our program causing. This could be um, either synchronous or asynchronous effect. Um, programs are executed in two phases. First, we build expressions using the DOS cell we've created, uh, and then we interpret those expressions using uh, separately built interpreters. Uh, and in imaginary syntax of non-existent TypeScript version, it will look like this. We create an interface um, for some business entity, for example, for database. This interface is polymorphic in the effect type and all of its um, functions return the result wrapped in that uh, po po polymorphic effect type F. Unfortunately, TypeScript doesn't have higher kind of types um, and we need to do some extra activity in order to uh, support this. But using the uh, defunctionalization technique, we can do this and in library FPTS, it's totally possible. So here's an example of uh, tagless final style uh, DSLs, uh, where we have an interface uh, for the database, which um, abstracts away the type of effect uh, and an interface for interacting with the network. And in order to actually be able to build programs using uh, those interfaces, and I should say that they are called F algebras because they're polymorphic in uh, higher kind of type F. Um, we require an additionally an interface of a monad to be present in our program so we can build a sequence of computations. So how we build programs using uh, those possibilities of we code to an abstract kind f instead of fixing it to some concrete value. Uh, we use instances of functor, monad, duplicative, alternative, and so on uh, to uh, actually express and combine computations. For example, in this example, um, I use monad instance to chain sequentially computations and functor instance to change the type of the uh, in this uh, example posts. And uh, finally, we inject runtime dependency on that uh, program polymorphic in effect type. Finally, we create a set of interpreters for that um, effect type, fixing it to some concrete effect type. Here I've uh, shown an example of interpreter fixed to uh, the effect type of a task, which is a lazy promise. Um, and this interpreter knows how to 
turn call to get posts into actual um, execution of some promise. And I should stress that using this technique, using Tegla's final, fi um, Tegla's final style, I apologize, uh, we can even abstract the asynchrony of the runtime. So, uh, for example, um, we can build uh, business logic using Monad interface to change computations and execute it in the production uh, runtime using task interpreter, which is asynchronous by its nature. And in test environment, uh, for example, in Jest or Mocha or whatever, uh, we can use synchronous interpreter, which uh, works, for example, with a state monad. Uh, and using this uh, approach, you get incredible benefits because you have written business logic only once and you are running it in a synchronous manner, uh, in a synchronous and blocking manner in production. But in tests, you can easily um, provide different mocks uh, without even having to mm, use mocking frameworks. And your tests work quickly and synchronously. For those of you who are mm, interested in building embedded DSLs, I suggest to refer to my workshop, uh, which takes a look at Tegra's final and free monads approach, which is another way of building embedded DSLs, which I haven't covered in this talk. Um, I think that's a really interesting uh, topic, so please check it out. Finally, the um, last topic I will be talking about is called indexed monads, um, which um, which uh, are related to general monads, but add uh, a few type parameters. When I teach others about indexed monads, I always say that uh, indexed monad should be uh, looked at like a state machine because it captures uh, the essence of state machine, the transition, the possibility of transition, I should even say, in the type signature. Um, and by modifying those types, we can force journey of our end user um, and make it type safe. Examples could be um, circuit breaker or um, payment transaction or some uh, complicated multi-stage object building uh, or even ensuring that you have set a response header in the web server before sending the res uh, response body. Uh, here's an interface of the core of indexed monad and indexed chain uh, interface. Uh, as you can see, it will um, allow transition uh, of states only um, for those types which match on the middle part. So uh, suppose we uh, have uh, a function which return uh, an effect which uh, could go from middle to output and we can chain this function only to, um, to a value um, for the effect which goes from the input to middle. And as a result, we get a combined value which goes from input to output directly. One of the examples uh, which I will uh, uh, refer here uh, is just an example of uh, building a hamburger. So for example, um, a properly built burger should have bottom bun, then some uh, condiments, then patty or maybe two cheese, onions, lettuce, tomato or no tomato, and then a top bun. If we uh, forget to call function, uh, for example, to add tomato, we get a compilation error, which will say that we have uh, finished adding lettuce, 
but to add a top bun we need to be in the state of uh, edit, uh, finishing adding tomato so in order to make this code compile I need to add another index chain call with a function which will add tomato to this burger um, and again we cannot reorder calls because this will uh, be an incorrect example um, I suggest for those of you who uh, became interested in indexed monads to take a look at uh, two mm, resources the uh, first one is incredible library by uh, Denis Fizzato and Giulio Canti called HyperTS uh, which is a port of pure scripts uh, library called Hyper which is a web server um, that uh, could be backed by any connect compatible uh, web server or Fastify and uh, that web server uses indexed monad to capture uh, different things uh, as I've uh, described um, for one of the examples could be ensuring that you have set all of the required headers before sending the response body and another example uh, is medium article about forcing building a good hamburger which I've briefly shown to you in this presentation um, but uh, this article uh, dives deeper into indexed monads and how to use them in TypeScript so okay to wrap it up we have uh, looked at possible ways of uh, using TypeScript's type system to make illegal states unrepresentable for example for um, in order to solve uh, an issue of passing username uh, to a function which expects users email we can use opaque types to distinguish uh, those two primitives um, for the issue of calling a function which expects validated data we should use smart validators and either monad to chain computations um, in order to disallow constructing incorrect objects we should use type level programming and make illegal business cases uh, inferred as never type uh, to solve um, an issue of executing a wrong chain of business functions um, it's possible to use tagless final or free or freer monads to build type safe DSLs uh, and ensure that those do cells uh, are the only way to write business lo uh, logic and finally uh, to stop making illegal state transitions of a finite state machine we can use indexed monads to capture that uh, set of valid transitions in type signature that's it from my side uh, for this talk. I thank you for your attention and if you have any questions or would like to learn more about typed functional programming in TypeScript, Scala or Haskell, please follow me on social media or read my blog. Thank you and goodbye.